Well, yesterday I talked for two hours uninterruptedly, so I'm hopeful that uh, there will be a sufficient response to that, that we can have some discussion about it today. This is the time when it's psychoactive, and that was the time of their rituals. Yeah, um, I would bet that what he was intending to indicate by his description of it as a vine that grows close to the ground was a what's called sacrostemma or ephedra. Both of these, uh, you know, the closest thing to what I'm talking about is this native plant called Mormon tea in California. Do any of you know it with the... It has a kind of odd habit of growth, long and unbranching uh, stems. This is one of the things that is always su- suggested, especially in the Kashmiri Shaivite tradition, as being uh, the Soma source. Yeah, yeah. And and it is a soma substitute in the reenactment of the Vedic ceremonies. Really, it's pretty unsatisfying to grapple with the soma problem because if you're true to the evidence, the, it's hard to make it fit anything very well. This book I mentioned yesterday when I did the survey called Hauma and Harmaline by Flattery it convinced me that I had been too quick to, to assume that Pergamon Harmala alone couldn't be a reliable hallucinogen. I never understood why um, Naranjo's patients in his book The Healing Journey reported ayahuasca-like visions when he didn't in fact give them ayahuasca, but he gave them harmaline. Now I understand that what I was in the dark about before was the fact that harmine is not strongly hallucinogenic and that that's what's in Banisteriopsis capi, activating DMT, but not contributing to the hallucinogenic activity really. So it's entirely possible that uh, uh, Soma was Pergamon Harmala. If this is true, it will be of great, and it will inspire great smugness in certain quarters because when you check back through the Soma controversy, the very earliest suggestion by a Western scholar was some a French character in 1701 who said it is the giant Syrian rue, which so it well may seem to be. The, the thing that is so peculiar about Amanita muscaria is that the active principle passes out in your urine so that that you can drink the urine a second time and obtain the intoxication. Well, this is a pretty extreme aspect to a rite, so you would expect that if this rite were being practiced by thousands of people and generating an entire literature, that this would be explicitly somewhere referred to in some way And in fact, it's impossible to torment the text of the Vedas to yield a convincing passage where uh, urine and cattle are explicitly connected to Soma. It just isn't there. What Flattery did was he worked from this uh, Avestan, Zend Avestan material, material generated by the religion of Zoroaster that is actually antedates this Vedic material, and says that all this talk of the pressings and the filters and all that only makes sense if Pergamon Harmala is what is being used. And so it may in fact be. Some of you have heard me talk about Mandayanism, which is this fascinating, very old cult in the Middle East they say and said different things in their peregrinations through time, but they claimed to be that branch of of original Christian intentionality that drew itself around John the Baptist. 
they were a baptismal cult pre-Christ, but just like 40 years before. And they then, in the, in the diaspora, they were in Lebanon for a long time, and they eventually made their way to the swamps of uh, Iraq and Iran, and where, what their fate there was. I have not heard. The last anthropology was done in the late 30s. But these people, Mandayans, Sabians, uh, have a mythology and, a, uh, and an ontology of being that is very suggestive of the kind of psychedelic conceptions of the soul and the afterlife that is characterized by the harmine using groups in the Amazon. For instance, they have the notion of um, the double, the uh, double that one meets at the end of life that comes to join with the departing soul. And interestingly, these people have uh, this very strongly held notion of a parallel dimension, but not with a lot of value judgment on it as to that it is a superior or inferior plane of reality. In other words, it is simply accessible and different. This seems to me to suggest that there may have been uh, Pergamon Harmala use all across the Anatolian uh, plateau and the Persian plain. This is where this plant is still used in Mandayan ceremonies and in preparing the, the halma in, in the uh, Parsi sacrifice. And that's a very old religion that is pre-Zoroastrian. So, you know, the central motif of Iranian religion is undifferentiated light. This is what it's all about. In t the Tibetan pantheon, it is manifest as uh, Amitabha, which is boundless light. Upame, uh is light. Upame is boundless light. And this Iranian hypostatization of God moved out in all directions. It infected uh, Mandayanism, Mandayan communities in Central Asia, in Samarkand and Khotan. And it was, uh, you know, a major focus of the... Of the uh, Hellenistic, mystical thing, especially in uh, in certain uh, cults. <laughs> well, that's enough about Soma. This is all unresolved now, you see, because of Flattery's book, because it was accepted that Soma was Amanita Muscaria simply on the weight of Wasson's reputation and public relations skill, really. But... but uh, the fact that nobody could ever get high from it w just was an insurmountable barrier to the theory. So now there's this other idea going around. No LSD comes after all this and there's something quite different. Does it, can you say anything about that at all? You mean in its modern manifestation? Well, um, I talked yesterday about these naturally occurring forms of ergot hallucinogens uh, LSD was invented by Albert Hoffman, a Swiss pharmaceutical chemist. He was trying to invent drugs like Pitocin, drugs which induce labor, because uh, these ergonomine compounds are extremely efficient, smooth muscle contractors. So they were exploring the possibility of a, of a drug patent on a compound that would induce labor. And he discovered, um, and I won't retell the story because I'm sure you all know it, it's enshrined in the annals of psychedelic mythology, but of the famous bicycle ride through the streets of Basel where he slowly dawned on him that something strange was going on. Um, but it was put away, this was in 37, it was put away on the shelf basically until 43, 
Then the Swiss began looking at it very quietly. It didn't begin to surface in the journals until 47, 48, and by 68, it was highly illegal and highly, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on it. So really, it only enjoyed 20 years uh, as a legal, obje- as a legitimate object of scientific research. So not enough was found out about it. It was all... uh, uh, The astonishing thing about LSD is that it's active in such small amounts, you know, that uh, we talked about this yesterday, that one gamma is a millionth of a gram. and, And what a little bit this is when you're accustomed to measuring drugs in milligrams, you know. Uh, um, One milligram is a thousand gamma. Well, very few drugs are active even at the one milligram level. Uh, Most drugs are active at the five to fifteen, some at hundreds of milligrams. So, uh, what, and and this spurred great hope and great... um, imagination in terms of experimental strategies because people said what this appears to be is a it it affects the mind very strongly in these tiny amounts so it appears that this is a doorway into understanding neurochemistry and what we have here is a either a synthetic neurotransmitter Or then there was the bad guy theory, which was that this was the so-called psychotomimetic. This was the idea that this metabolism of schizophrenics would be found to differ significantly from that of normals and that the culprit would be found to be excess production of an LSD-like compound. Well, this this is a reasonable hypothesis and money was spent on it but it never came to much. Um, The data did not support anybody's model of what was happening. DMT, because it is so spectacularly hallucinogenic and so rapidly uh, returns you to the baseline of consciousness, was early looked at as as the possible schizogen. But what they found was, yes, people do produce DMT in their brains, Uh, normally and they do when they are institutionalized for schizophrenia and you and some schizophrenics have more than normals some normals have more than schizophrenics no conclusion can be drawn there appears to be no correlation between the presence of DMT and schizophrenia well while this kind of research was going on LSD was breaking out of the laboratory and creating a social phenomenon that, you know, for good or ill, wafts its gentle waves against this shore to this day and hour. The thing about LSD that made it unique in that situation is that uh, because you can theoretically get so many doses from a gram, it becomes a tool, a political tool, because you, a single chemist can produce 10 million hits. Well, this is not some guy getting rich. This is about changing history when you're talking about 10 million uh, consciousness-expanding experiences. 10 million? There were only a million students in Tiananmen Square, and one guy could make 10 million hits in a 72-hour run. And there were dozens of these guys with different ethics and different levels of sophistication and dedication. So it was like a a situation where um, social enzymes, pheromones signaling change in the hive structure were just overproduced. And of course there was a recidivist reaction to that. And that Um, that killed the goose as far as psychedelic research was concerned. When talking about these indoles, the thing that it's important to notice that is not very often stressed is that uh, 
the window of opportunity for research was so short. I mean, LSD was surfaced in the journals in 48. By 68, it was illegal worldwide. DMT was discovered in 56 in Czechoslovakia. By 68, it was illegal worldwide. Ibogaine was never studied at all and was made illegal in 1968. I mean, it never was studied by modern pharmacology. The last people who looked at it were in the 1920s. Um, the LSD history we just covered, psilocybin discovered in 53, illegal by 68 so forth and so on. So to pretend, you know, that we fully explored psychedelics is like pretending that we fully explored the moon. It is, in fact, a fairly apt metaphor since the curve of exploratory energy in these two dimensions followed each other fairly closely. I mean, nobody's been back to the moon in a while, and it would take 15 years if a decision, a command decision were made today. And let's hope that some kind of coming to grips with this psychedelic option is not, uh, is not so hard to reach. It doesn't require the technological retooling, but it requires ideological retooling to be able to face it again. That's the, the thing. It's created a social revolution, hasn't it, in a very short period of time? Yes, well, um, it was, if my notion that we should view these things as uh, catalysts of memes, catalysts of language expansion, then though there have been shamans throughout human history using hallucinogens, there's never been a situation where hundreds of millions of people over a decade open themselves up to that. No, it really put the spin on uh, the situation. We're still reeling from it. I don't know if you've been here when we've looked at any of these maps, but it clearly shows that that's when the great change came, that there was this recidivist upward-moving curve of um, c conservative uh, tendencies that precisely mirrored... Uh, the Mycenaean uh, breakup of Minoan, late Minoan culture happening through the late 1960s. That that's where the cultural cascade of effects began that we are reacting to in the same way that the classical world had to react to Hellenism. So, yeah, it made a revolution. There's never been anything like it. They've never... They've never stopped congratulating themselves for getting the lid back on that one because, uh, you know, those of us who were there could not imagine that you could get the lid back on it. It was a sobering, a sobering lesson for those of us who have faith in the power of ideas because it's just like this thing in China. You know, millions of people can march and great... Clarity can be forged in struggle, but, you know, when they come with the machine guns, the taste for politics turns bitter, and they always do come with machine guns. This is the thing that we seem to have to learn over and over again about uh, the, 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 the hand that governs. But again, the thing is, you see, one of the ways of modeling the psychedelic experience is to see it as that it dissolves conventional wisdom. It dissolves uh, adherence to group values it, because it dissolves all structure, because it dissolves syntax. It shows the provisional nature of syntax. Well, how are you going to hold on to an ideology when, you know the assembly language upon which the convention of ideology depends is dissolving before your eyes. So, uh, and I think that, that was very scary, uh, that kind of accelerated change. What I would hope is that we could turn psychology toward looking at these things 
it, and and to present it as uh, an enhancement of creativity. Try and look at consciousness as a resource for want of which we are going mad because we clearly have the technological might, the computer power, the managerial skill, etc., etc., to straighten out the mess we're in. But what we don't have is the will. You know, we are just in the will department, a bunch of cannibals, and can't seem to get hold of those levers and do anything about it. Well, I think it's because of this uh, malaise or this shift in psychic dominance that has been allowed to go on throughout the whole course of Judeo-Christian civilization that has suppressed experiential access to the sacred. And in the absence of this experiential access to the sacred, then you get ideology and doctrine and dogma and pontification and uh, you know, do or die philosophies across the entire political, religious spectrum. And we're very afraid to uh, contemplate a restructuring of society that would actually restructure uh, our own authenticity. When we talk about social restructuring, we see it in terms often of planting trees in the Amazon or getting, you know, figuring out a way to get a free market happening in the Soviet Union. Doubtless all these things need to be done, but uh, the, uh, the real immediate field where something can be done is probably in our own, uh, in our own behavior, in our own commitment to some kind of authentic activity that leads out of this. Well, so for me that has meant trying to understand uh, this hallucinogenic plant option because, uh, you know, I take life seriously as a problem. I view it as a puzzle of some sort. I believe, I've seen things which cause me to believe that it's some kind of a, a conundrum, a, a labyrinthine puzzle, a fitted together thing that if, properly understood will deliver one and you know I don't know whether it's my proclivity or my birth sign or whatever it is but I have the faith that this is essentially an act of understanding that it is not an act of let us say surrender or abandonment or fusion or it's control it's an act of understanding that there is a, a way to break through and then say, aha, and I'm illuminated, I see what it is, I, how could I have not seen what it is, now I see what it is. Well, the only thing which comes anywhere near these places for the common man are these relationships to these magical vegetables. I mean, you can, it, it's not satisfying to just read Meister Eckhart and Hildegard von Bingen and all these people because what their testimony is saying is that it is a birthright of us all, you know? I mean, we shouldn't imagine ourselves as less than the best. Because if you do that, you have some kind of a loser's scenario. And who wants to have a loser's scenario? Robert Anton Wilson said something like this. He said, he said I believe that the power elite rules the world. And I define the power elite as myself and my friends. If you don't define the power elite that way, then you have a loser's scenario. And who wants that? <laughs> So think of yourselves as the uh, ruling elite and central party command structure of uh, the global family, then act from there. I've been thinking about, was it you who asked the question about what should we do and is there something to be done? And yeah, Several people asked. Early on. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about it because I wasn't entirely satisfied with my answer and I'm not entirely satisfied with this answer, but here's the state of play. 
It seems like what the problem is, is it's a tension between immediacy and the desire to plan. And so I feel all these political obligations that it doesn't seem right to say that we should just watch the Tao flower of the novelty wave carry us toward the arms of the mother goddess at the end of the millennium. We know that's happening, but shouldn't we do something while we're waiting for that to happen? And it seems to me that maybe the answer is as simple as... uh, this slogan which somebody made up, I don't know who, you, some of you may know who, this slogan, uh, think globally, act locally. And that we have a tendency to want to go on crusade because the world is in such a state. And, but planning is a, some kind of a demon in, in a way, because our whole problem is that we planned ourselves into this situation. So instead of feeding energy to this global image of a, of a homeostatically regulated culture, atmosphere, industrial base, economy, so forth and so on, uh, it seems like those contr- large-scale control functions can be left to the collectivity, to the marriage between the unconscious and the cybernetic coral reef. And that what we really want in the domain of planning is an abandonment of ideology. That ideology is poisonous. All ideology is poisonous. And that what we are, I hope, tending toward is a kind of evaporation of culture evaporation of culture as a product of ideology and its replacement uh, with natural processes in other words that there is a, an obvious way to solve certain problems there because it's management you know energy efficient waste efficient so forth and so on in other words that pragmatism if looked upon from the point of view of natural selection or something like that, is a fairly profound principle. So, boiling, I didn't mean for this to be so long, but what it comes out as then is where we are most effective, where we are most clear-eyed in sending energy correctly from ourselves to the world and receiving it back is in the immediate domain. And that means in the immediate temporal domain, in the immediate uh, financial domain, in the immediate spatial domain. And that when we um, aspire above that to this global control system, then it doesn't work because it's not really our role to function like that. And, and by us, I mean everybody, because I was amazed to lie in the hot tubs this week and listen to various people planning the fates of millions of people, uh, discussing you know, where the economic zones in the Soviet Union should be opened up, how the diplomatic crisis in China should be resolved. I mean, people who just routinely take it upon themselves to run the world for the rest of us. There's a deeper level, this is a slight turn on this, but there's a deeper level on this idea, to this idea of pragmatism, which I was thinking about because I was thinking about yesterday's lecture and how it was so, it was a lot of information. And I wondered what other lectures might be like that that would be so full of information. And then I thought, I reviewed in my mind the history of art from the point of view of realism. You know, realism is this funny thing where people painted on their bodies and scarified themselves and painted in styles that have been rediscovered in the 20th century. Impressionism, symbolism, uh, abstract expressionism. We see all this in the cave 
paintings in Africa and in southern France and so forth and so on. But um, once the Greeks got their camp in order, they set off in this funny direction, which was they wanted marble to be like flesh. They did not want to symbolize the human form or evoke it or make an image of it. They wanted to find out what it was by duplicating it exactly. And they were able to do this and produced, you know, these things, which I don't know if any of you have visited the museum at the Parthenon or the Metropolitan in New York <laughs> City. You get it from this Greek stuff. I mean, I think even if you're pretty lumpen, you suddenly understand what art is about, why people pay $11 million for a piece of marble, because what real genius is, is, you know, you have to put out your hand to satisfy yourself that this is not real breathing human flesh. And these faces, you know, have minds behind them. And when you stand and look in them, you say, so this is what the thing about Greece is all about. Now I understand that some kind of magical thing. Well, you know, Eleusis was this central focus for the mystical intentionality of the Greek mind. This ties in with this thing that William Blake said about attend the minute particulars. Remember we talked about that? About He said this was the basis of poetry and understanding reality was attention to the minute particulars. So there is a way of opening beyond symbols, beyond language. And we have, we call it realism, but we don't recognize it for what it is. I mean, realism is thought of as another ism, but it isn't another ism. It's an ontos of a completely different order. There are isms and there is realism. And realism seeks to go beyond isms, to go beyond language, to go beyond expectation and the forward-moving net of language and to present us with something which is, you know, shocking and infinitely deep and beyond contravention. This is the thing. And so um, this thing has been carried forward mostly in art, mostly as an intuition. It's not clear to me that it's ever been exactly articulated as a philosophy, but this is what the light of Caravaggio and uh, you know, the recessional distances of the brothers Van Eyck and you know, Turner and all of this stuff. It's a going into the stuff of the world without preconception, attempting you know, the great discovery that shadows are not always black you know, somebody had to look to, to figure that out and then to uh, embody it against the flow of all understanding. The discovery of perspective is this peculiar episode in the history of Western thought that is never discussed sufficiently. We are asked to believe that somewhere between the death of Giotto and the death of Michelangelo, European human beings suddenly understood that things got smaller the further away from you they were and therefore created the world of pictorial space that we have inhabited ever since. Well, um, you know, in an earlier lecture I told the story about how Thomas Aquinas proved his sanctity by being able to look at open books and then later tell what he had read without ever moving his lips. This was silent reading and it was viewed as a miracle by his contemporaries because they all had to vocalize while they read. Well, uh, this is a similar kind of phenomenon. This sudden popping into existence of the recessional distance and the whole set of understandings that allows us to navigate three-dimensional space. What is happening here? Does language make way for this stuff? Is it biological? 
Is it just happened to happen during the Italian Renaissance? How can a convention of painters of a courtly class become a way of inhabiting space and time for the entire population of an ancient continent? It it's defies understanding. What is actually being tracked is some kind of recent readjustment of the uh, information processing values in the human brain-mind system. And these things are very close to the surface and very easily perturbed. Uh, you know, Julian Jaynes in his book about the bicameral mind felt that uh, there had been a major shift in the construction of consciousness at the time of Homer. That uh, before Homer, people didn't exactly have egos. They were sort of like, uh, soulless beings which when put under pressure by like a tight situation in battle would have a magical voice speak to them in their head and tell them what to do and they called this their demon, their familiar their titulary animal or god and, that, and then he felt that this autonomous function of the psyche later became incorporated into the larger structure of the human mind as the ego. And that what we use as an ego was once a god. This is the depths to which we have fallen that we, you know, have, have uh, shackled a god into the service of uh, managing our portfolios. You know, in, it's a principle that's very old in nature. For instance, mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the human cell, are these little enzymatic engines that were originally free-swimming bacteria that have been, through evolution, incorporated into the dynamics of larger structures and embedded there and now they, their energy is all channeled to the purposes of the cell. And they have their own genetic material and everything. They are clearly relict organisms embedded in cytoplasmic material. So this principle of, of incorporation of the autonomous element to enrich the original structure is pretty well there. An instance of that that I'm interested in is this the pregnancy of language in these Amazonian tribes that are using Banisteriopsis-type uh, hallucinogens. I mean, something is trying to happen. This language is just sub-visible, and the whole mystery that haunts the culture is that it isn't always sub-visible, that, you know on good Saturday nights when everything is clicking, they can actually drag out this stuff from another dimension and uh, play with it. And you just wonder, you know, uh, the beta-carbolines are so closely related to endogenous brain chemistry, and so is the DMT that it's running on. I mean, clearly these people are rubbing up against... Uh, an evolutionary interface spot, a place where human ability, human neural processing, human signal making functions are bubbling together with the potential of a sudden perturbation to a higher and previously unanticipated state of order. And I think that it, it has something to do with this projective imagination through acoustical sound, that this idea has haunted the human mind and certainly the Western mind through the tradition of Pythagoreanism and the Orphic religions, this tradition of using sound to perform magic and transcend levels and see into the fabric of, uh, of nature. And what's going on in these Amazon situations where, you know, the conventions of modern physics mean nothing. Nobody's speaking English. Nobody knows about the periodic table or Newton or any of that. They're operating in another world. And what they're doing is in these states of intoxication, 
projecting this phenomenon for which we don't even have a word. I mean, telepathy is a thin notion. Telepathy is, I think, you hear me think. That's not what this is. This is that these people can project whole scenarios of, of uh, three-dimensional phenomena that are part of a group perception that is not operating under the will of individuals, but that is somehow the, the elan vital, the, the life force of the group itself. I mean, we don't have a sociological vocabulary for this stuff. Anthropologists talk about manas and magic and, you know, morphogenetic fields and this and that and the other hand. But this is reductionism because the, the living fact of this stuff is pretty astonishing. So, to change the subject, you mentioned uh, the heretics in your talk this afternoon, that Syrian sect, was it? The Mandaeans. The Mandaeans. And we talked earlier before coming in also of the uses of heresy and your passion for them. I wonder if you'd uh, link that to Talk what about we heresy. should do. <laughs> link that to what action to take. Well, it's always heresy is always safe uh, if you're scripting your life for the history books. You just can't go wrong as a heretic because they're always vindicated. The trouble is there can be some rough spots along the way. Uh, a favorite heretic of mine is Giordano Bruno, who some of you may know about, who uh, was burned at the stake as the price of his commitment to heresy. Bruno discovered the infinity of the universe. That's what he discovered. He looked into the night sky and was the first person in Europe to say, those aren't adamantine shells of Aristotelian crystals, crystalline spheric material. Those are stars, those are suns, like our sun, and they must go on forever. It opened before him, and he was burned at the stake. The period that is so rich in heresy and has been a great inspiration for me is the Hellenistic syncretism that uh, follows upon the classical period in Greece and the rise of Roman uh, power and uh, at the same time ferment in the Jewish end of the Mediterranean to create, and all kinds of things were happening actually, there were gymnosophists coming from India teaching yoga in the second century BC in Rome and there were, you know, Egyptian followers of uh, Thoth and Isis, and there were Docetians and Montanists and uh, uh, followers of Simon the Magician. And these were there, a vast spectrum of cults ranging from Orthodox Jewish cults such as the Nabataeans and uh, the Zealots and presumably the Mandaeans that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then there were... Uh, Jewish mysticism infected with Platonic ideas, uh, Philo-Judeus, Apollodorus, Musaeus, all these minor philosophers were teaching. There were Pythagoreans, there were atomists, uh, and the most interesting of these were proto-Christian, neo-Christian, pseudo-Christian, crypto-Christian sects that were competing with what eventually became Christianity. Some of you may know of this sect uh, that lived, that did some of the Dead, Scree uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nabataeans, who lived outside of Jerusalem and down in the Dead Sea. These were the people that James Pike was investigating when he died in the Negev. Uh, a few years ago, well, actually over many years, there has been, was a very important manuscript find in 1948 at a place called, uh, a, a Greek Orthodox monastery called Chenoboskion in Upper Egypt that was on a much older site called Nag Hammadi. And out of the ground at Nag Hammadi came 43 
codices that were uh, by groups of scholars coordinated worldwide uh, translated through the 50s and 60s and 70s this is now now available as the Nag Hammadi library and it's very very interesting stuff because this stuff went into the ground AD 270 so the later bishops the patristic recensionists uh, the diddlers and fiddlers and all of that were kept away from it. Nobody had seen this stuff since A.D. 280. So uh, it was very, very interesting. Of the, of the 53 texts, 41 were unknown in any other version. Of those that were known, there, were, there was some of the late Plato. There, were Goss, there was portions of Matthew but uh, what was interesting were these previously unknown texts, some of which were very close to gospel-type material, um, a gospel according to Philip, the second known version of the gospel of Philip, a gospel according to Thomas, the doubter, my favorite guy. And, but more interesting is the less pseudo-Christian material, this exegetical and mystical material that just takes off, that is proto-hermetic. Some of it shows traces of Indian philosophies, transmigration of souls, yogic practices. Uh, some of it reads almost like Maria Sabina's mushroom chants. Uh, there's one text called uh, The Voice of the Thunder, that has a meter and a rhythm that is precisely Maria Sabina. So Gnosticism is the general banner under which all of this stuff can be placed. Gnostics believe the central tenet of Gnosticism, and it's hard to put this across because modern Gnostics are such cheerful people, but they, they've forgotten their, their real roots. The, the central perception of Gnosticism, no matter how you slice it, is that we don't belong here, that we are strangers, that something terrible happened, and that accounts for why we're here, that we were destined for a much better deal, and something went terribly, terribly wrong. It takes different forms. As some Gnostic mythologies are fairly straightforward, some are fairly Baroque. The one that I enjoy is one of the more Baroque ones. The second century Gnostic uh, bishop Valentinius had this notion that there were 36 archons. They are demons of progressively lessening power that interpose themselves between man and uh, a true vision of God. And the last of the archons, the 36th archon, was Sophia, uh, and the only of the archons that was female. There's a tremendous sexual ambivalence in Gnosticism, which we can talk about, which is resolved in different ways. But anyway, the 36th archon is Sophia, she looked upward toward the higher God and saw him bring forth creation of which she was the final manifestation. And in her heart, an avarice grew, a wish to create in the same manner as the highest and hidden All-Father. And she brought forth, um, it's described as an abortion. She self fertilized herself. She did not understand the requisites of creation and she turned inward into herself and she brought forth a monstrosity. And this monstrosity is the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, Jehovah. And when she saw what she had done, that she had brought forth this monstrosity, she flashed through a whole bunch of emotions very quickly. Horror, guilt, rage, fear, agony, like that. 
and these emotions of the errant Sophia condensed as the material world over which Ildabuath was then made Lord. So the entire material universe is seen as the condensed emotional debris of the horror of the 36th Archon upon witnessing her own creation, who is then made God over this universe. Well, even though this is this really bad scene it still nevertheless has this extremely tenuous connection to the highest and hidden All-Father in the form of what is called the scintilla, the spark, the soul spark of divinity. So then the goal of Gnostics born into this unfortunate world is to gather the light together, to save the light. The light is defiled by its presence in the world of material existence and the light must be gathered. Well, so then the central soteriological uh, concern, that means the central salvational concern of Gnosticism is how shall we gather the light? And their whole theology then is what is the light? How should we gather it? And once we have it, what do we do with it? And then there were various answers I mentioned the sexual tension inside Gnosticism. It took two forms, both wild extremes. In one case, Gnostic hermeneutics reasoned along the following lines. Life is defiled, the light is defiled by the material universe. Therefore, we should withhold entry of the light into matter. Therefore, we must be celibate we must have no children. And in some cases, this took the form of saying, and we sanction no form of sexual union which could lead to procreation. So they were kinky in that style. The other direction that they took was extreme celibacy just simply no sexual contact whatsoever. And then um, the third option, and these options had differing percentages of loyalty as Roman society underwent exterior transformations. The third Gnostic stance was man is divine. We are of the light and nothing in the universe of Ildabawath can pollute the light, for it is of a higher order, and therefore we can do anything we want. Yes, so, so you could be a Gnostic and line up for scourges and uh, heavy dieting, or you could line up for total libertinism and eating and drinking anything you want and any kind of... So this was the spectrum, and this was, of course, very baffling to Christian morality. Uh, but Christianity has a, an incredible debt to Gnosticism. I mean, the Gospel of John and Revelations, uh, I mean, this whole bit, in the beginning was the Word, this notion of the going forth of the Word, this is thoroughly Gnostic, and the, the struggle between light and darkness, you know, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. This is, the str this is essentially the, uh, the uh, Manichaean thing, which is a form of Gnosticism. Manichaeanism is a, a, a dualistic Persian religion that had great sway in Persia th uh, through this slightly later phase. Manai was its prophet. Manai was a Mandaean. His father was a priest in the Mandaean faith. Well, why talk about this so much? Well, I don't know. Um, permission for heresy is never a bad idea. And I think this is an important issue which is not resolved. I mean, we are all love bunnies of one sort or another. But what do you do about this thing? Are we of the earth? Is it our charge and our destiny? Or are we from another place? How can, you can't have it both ways. This is a pretty uh, clear division. What are we to be? Are we to integrate with nature? 
or are we to transcend it through an act of conjuration out of the self, which is what culture is. I mean, apparently we have made the choice and all we're doing now is the philosophical dotting of the I's. Our commitment to technology is thoroughly Gnostic. Our commitment to... Um, <coughs> we believe that nature is something that withholds secrets from us. Uh, that we must wrest the secrets of nature from it in order to somehow complete ourselves. And, uh, you know, modern Gnosticism plays all this down. Modern Gnosticism is existential and capitalizes more on the idea of abandonment. They're less interested in the program for returning to the higher and hidden All-Father and much more interested in talking about how we are abandoned by the All-Father and therefore what a drag it is and what can we do about it. So that people like Heidegger are thoroughly Gnostic in their thinking. I mean, anybody who is not... Because you see, what Gnosticism denied was the presence of God in the world. You need to understand that, that it was an article of faith of Gnostics that this is really a f long way from God that we are really off way, way out over, away from it. And Christianity preserves this dualism in the eternality of evil, in the idea that, you know, there isn't a final, a final fusion. They preserve the distinction down to the last knell of recorded time. So that's a thoroughgoing dualism. But my approach to this kind of thing is basically Jungian. I mean, that's where I got my interest in all of this material. See, I think that what we're always seeing is psyche, that we're always seeing uh, a mirroring of the intentionality of ourselves to concretize consciousness, to put a name on it. And so... I call my I have called myself at times a noetic archaeologist. What I like to do is go and dig up not pot shards and glass beads, but ideas, old old ideas that have been under the dirt a long long time. And this is what I essentially did here with the I Ching. And Gnosticism is another boneyard, and alchemy is another boneyard and the Maya are another boneyard, and ancient Hawaii is another. And I love to go into these things and draw conclusions, you know. It's all very pregnant with intention toward the, the, the person who comes to it with an open mind. I mean, everything wants to speak, everything wants to guide us. I haven't talked much about it, but I always think there are so many ways in which it's true that it would have been so much different if Aldous Huxley had uh, guided things uh, through the turmoil of the 1960s. Aldous Huxley was, uh, you know, a British intellectual, a novelist, a social critic, but uh, even before he wrote The Doors of Perception, he wrote a book called, uh, or an essay called The Art of Seeing. And, uh, you know, this was gospel as far as my mother was concerned. I mean, my mother was an extraordinary woman. I don't know how she had the intuition to be into the things that she was into. But it's this thing about seeing. And this goes back to what I was saying about realism training the eye. What these Renaissance people and these Greek people were doing with the recessional distances and the nudes was they were really looking. They were really seeing. They were not painting stories that they were telling in their minds, but they were actually paying attention to texture and shadow and light. And this learning to see taught very early is a tremendous inoculation against cultural viruses, value viruses and linguistic viruses. Because, uh, and you don't see if you grow up with television, 
you know, television is something that you look at. It's like uh, it has this flat quality. It is undemanding. Everything has been stripped of depth before it ever reaches you, even to be offered for your, for your perception. Well, what do you think about the more cubist, what's, you know, Picasso brought in cubism and changed the entire direction of art away from reality and into a different view of seeing things, you know, from many facets and broken down into other, you know, in a sense, from other dimensions. Well, I'm surprised at my stirring defense of realism because I'm much more sympathetic to... Um, my interest in art history was always 20th century art, and what I loved was the upheaval and the screw-you attitude. I mean, I was thinking today as I thought about this lecture about myself as a 13-year-old kid and who were my heroes, uh, you know, it wasn't baseball players and it wasn't even astronauts, it was Jackson Pollock. And, you know, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a kid from Wyoming who went to New York and drank hard in bars and produced paintings that 99% of everybody hated and that I would insist were in fact works of staggering genius. And I would triumph and this would, and it was this whole thing. I mean, I was living in a small town in western Colorado, you have to understand. I mean, the notion of a man hurling paint at a canvas, and it just outraged the inner Amish of the place where I was living. Uh, no, I think all of this stuff is, is uh, very important and that art, I, I didn't mean to suggest a value judgment in favor of realism over other artistic styles because I think by the time the 20th century came around, uh, realism had grown self-defeating. It was something which had to be pried loose and perfected. And for me, I think it, it's probably perfected in um, Jan van Eyck. The, al the altarpieces of the Van Eyck brothers or Caravaggio or, you know, by the time you get to uh, Belazquez and uh, the Mannerists, something else is happening. It's like they've overshot the mark. With Mannerism, it's getting weird. It looks at first like realism, but then you realize that bizarrely morbid distortions are taking place and that what is seeping upward into the realist uh, canvas is the unconscious and that you know these odd intimations of sadomasochism and mania and all this stuff that you're getting off of this stuff it's not you it is there they're trying to make it like that and the mannerists set the stage for full permission to push off into then romanticism, really. The, the evo evocation of emotion through the manipulation of, um, of image, of natural image, but it's really the thinking is not uh, realistic. The thinking is allegorical. Romanticism always tends toward allegory. That's why these islands sucked at by blackened water and covered over in fallen gardens and crumbling ruins. These don't exist anywhere. This is not reportage of the natural world. These are dreamscapes of a morbid, uh, a, a, a morbid imagination. Okay, well, so then it all runs out in the 19th century. I mean, for my money, 19th century art is pretty dismal. It's very much of the academy. In France, you've got Watteau and Fragonard, and in, in, in England, you have, uh, you know, Reynolds and all of this stuff going on until this romantic morbidity gives rise to, like, an out of the, really, the recrudescence of that movement come people like uh, Redon and uh, Moreau, the French symbolists. This is, since, this is consequent upon, interestingly enough, an interest in psychedelic drugs 
these people are smoking hashish and drinking absinthe and uh, are familiar with uh, opium and this kind of thing. And they set the stage then for uh, the pre-Raphaelite thing and which I don't know whether you view that as design or art, but simultaneously Impressionism is happening. And Impressionism, strangely enough, is like art in the service of the realist ideal again, but in strange clothing. Because what they were trying to do was shed this academic, allegorical, uh, symbolic stuff and just show light, you know. It was an effort to do that. And it gave permission for, well, another thing then. So there were two simultaneous tendencies there. The Impressionists with their concern with what the eye sees and light, and then operating in the background stuff like the pataphysicians and the Dadaists later, where it was all about again the unconscious and bringing that in the same the same tendency which had infected mannerism then in, came in as surrealism in the 20th century and because of Freud and Jung and all this stuff so I think that the whole history of 20th century art is a reaction against morbid romanticism which was probably a pretty good thing to to overthrow but I saw people like Pollock or specifically Pollock, as in a sense realists in that what they were showing us was chaos. That's sort of the evolution of an artist as you as you gain more and more ability as you know you get past the symbols and you get into realism. But then you take the realism and you you use it as a as you can use it as a fiction in a sense. So you can you can do what the mannerists did and go into a dream right. state or. What, so it becomes a, a language, a visual language that can describe things that our words can. Well, Pollock made an <coughs> immense intellectual journey because he started out not, I mean, he was born in Cody, Wyoming. This is a strike against you in the first place. And he studied art under Thomas Hart Benton who was the absolute epitome of the American realist school. I mean, if you don't know Thomas Hart Benton, he did WPA murals of women bringing jugs of cider to men in the fields at noontime. In other words, glorification of uh, the American working class in a style almost reminiscent of the Mexican mural style of Diego Rivera. Pollock came out of that, you know. Um, he used a screwdriver, was his major instrument, and he stood back or stood over his canvases on stepladders and whipped paint across them and built up these layered things that were just uh, amazing. And what they were, were they were the abstract expressionist equivalent of an atomic explosion. This is what the 50s was, uh, was all about. So realism came to mean looking into many strange parts of reality. You know, at what point does the dream get integrated to where it's us? At the point where we control it like we control our voice and our head? Well, we have this admiration for the Australian style of relating to the dream time. But if we continue to develop our technology the way we do, uh, you know, we have our own dream time. It's watching television, and it's probably going to deepen. I mean, I, I think that our appetite for sensation and entertainment is driving that industry to develop itself almost more rapidly than any other. And... Uh, because it's all mythic, what's on television. Television is not reality. Television is, is the cultural myth about reality. This is where the archetypes in the American unconscious are to be met, you know, tough cops and jiggle blondes and all these people that are in our cultural 
mass programming are running around in there. Oh, it's terrible. It's just that we have such a tacky set of images. Uh, it could be epical. Imagine if we were 19th century Germans. Television would be like Wagner. <laughs> you just did it. I wanted you to switch and do a similar kind of historic uh, analysis that you did for Gnosticism and for art and music and so hmm. Overview and oh. shifts. Well, I don't really, I don't claim to know a lot about music. Well, I'm what pretty. Did Wagner represent for you? Well, Wagner comes late. Uh, what I would say about the, uh, I mean, I think music is very important. We said in here on a different day that uh, architecture was frozen music, and therefore music must be unfrozen architecture. And, and what did you mean? What could you say about that? Um, there, this Pythagorean thing, this very old thing, this discovery of these apparently natural relationships that are very mysterious between the, str the plucked strings so that if you stretch gut between bone antlers and you pluck certain strings, other strings in a perceived to be natural relationship called an octave will also vibrate in harmony. This is the key concept here, harmony. People saw this, and Pythagoras, or, you know, apocry apocryphally, what Pythagoras did was he filled glass tubes with water, and when he had two glass tubes tuned so that they were an octave apart, it was observed that the amount of water in them could be expressed as a mathematical ratio. Well, this touches on a very mysterious aspect of things that nobody quite understands and you don't even hear people talk about it because it's so problematic. And that is this. Why does mathematics have something to do with nature? Why does mathematics have anything to do with nature? Think about what mathematics is. Mathematics is the operations you can perform on numbers. Well, num nature is, you don't see numbers. And yet, this has been the fundamental insight of the Western mind that has allowed mad miracle after demonic miracle to be conjured out of nature. The discovery of the curious parallelism between nature and operations performed on numbers. Well, it comes out of this Pythagorean religious mentality, which observed, you know, these ratios and related them to the sounds and said, well, then there can be a mathematical theory of music. And then they observed, they observed regularity in other phenomena. The stars had long been observed to be regular. Well, so then they began to think in terms of regular, perfect things versus irregular, mundane things. And in this climate, Platonism was able to come into being. And Platonism makes an absolute division, you know, between the world of archetypal perfect things and then the lower slice of reality. Music was carrying all of this along. And uh, if you're interested in uh, ancient music and, uh, and uh, its impact on ancient philosophy, these books by Maclean, The Myth of Invariance, is one of them. It's a study of mathematics in Plato and the Rig Veda, and it's all musical mathematics. They were studying proportion, harmony, relationship. Now notice that in this situation where the string is plucked and the, the other strings in octaves above and below vibrate, this is a very cogent demonstration of action at a distance, something which 
uh, is very troubling even in modern conceptions. But it's a very cogent demonstration of action at a distance. It shows that there need not be a connecting medium for force and activity to be transmitted across space. In other words, it is an argument for magic, for uh, etheric uh, influences and this sort of thing. And so then the theory quickly grew that obviously then the way to influence these things was through music, through sound, and theories of tone grew up. And the seven planetary uh, bodies that were familiar to the astrologers were connected to seven tones, and then a correspondence was recognized between seven metals. And a map of the world was slowly constructed that had music at its uh, ultimate basis. There's a wonderful book that deals in part with all of this that some of you may know called Hamlet's Mill. Hamlet's Mill is the story of uh, this very old myth that occurs all over the world about how somebody has a mill, a little grinder, and somebody else steals it, and then the thief rows across a body of water with the mill in a boat, and the mill sinks the boat, and the mill is grinding out salt. And this is, in one version, the explanation for why the ocean is salty. It's because... Uh, off the coast of Norway in that place called the Maelstrom, that is the mill. And down at the bottom it is grinding out salt. And um, Giorgio de Santayana, who wrote this book, Hamlet's Mill, with Hilda von Dechend, uh, talked about it as a myth of a movement of the stellar machinery that stars which were near the pole moved beneath the surface of the sea and the mill was lost and a whole world age was thrown uh, into confusion. And a lot of the uh, discussion of this hinges on uh, looking at Rig Vedic and Platonic musical theory. The, these ayahuasca songs in the Amazon are visually intended. They are to be seen not to be heard. I mean, the people uh, criticize them that way, they critique them that way. Uh, Voice is primarily a vehicle imagined to affect color vision. And, uh, you know, if we could see what we meant, the ambiguity would leave our intention to communicate with each other. This would be a kind of telepathy the seeing of meaning. Well, when you think about what meaning is, there's no reason why it should be processed through hearing. It's not particular, it has nothing particularly to do with hearing. Meaning is a much fuller and richer signal than hearing. Why shouldn't it be conveyed visually? All ki- when I look at this room, I'm not listening to it. I'm looking at it, you know, and the meaning of what is going on comes to me through my eyes. This is how the meaning of the world presents itself. We don't listen to the world, but we listen to speech for its meaning. And this closes us toward many things and pushes us uh, in a certain direction. We don't have any medium that we can physically produce, you know, other than our electronic medium that we can easily produce a visual image to share. Print. We, we read. But you mean conversationally and instantaneously, yeah, right? Like, like you can with speech. Well, yeah, this is where you have to take drugs to push the argument further because what you have to hypothesize is uh, that it might be possible to generate an acoustical hologram with your voice or something mm. like that. In other words, what... When, you're t- when you take ayahuasca with these people in the jungle and you see the songs, the reason you see the songs is because you're loaded. Well, how um, 
loaded do you have to be to see the songs would be a good question for researchers to ask. Maybe you don't have to be overtly stoned at all. Maybe you could be have a sub-threshold amount of harmine in your system, and when they started singing, lo and behold, here it would appear. Is it not possible, theoretically possible at any rate, that once this has happened in your system, whatever this has gone through physiologically and whatever other way, that the path is there, that there would be a way to learn that thing that you could do it on Thursday morning? On the night. Isn't that what your brother was trying to do with the sounds yeah. in the Amazon? See, there is, there is something going on here because um, in the pineal gland, harmine is produced. So the And DMT is produced in the brain too. So the chemical prerequisites for the brain state are there. I think the first meeting we held, I talked about the fact that people who have smoked DMT then report months, years later, dreams in which they smoke DMT, and it happens in the dream. Okay, this is a major piece of evidence. This means it can happen, that it's not chemically exogenous. But then the question is, how the hell do you get to the same place as you are in a dream when someone passes you the glass pipe? But the very fact that it can happen, and and so then, um, so it lies very close to the level to the to uh, to the level of consciousness you see. And the, these people who've been in the Amazon all these twenty thousand years that we've been calling primitive, while we've been inventing technology and doing all this other stuff, what they've been doing is every Saturday night exposing themselves to a linguistic catalyst. Well, so we think, well, maybe they have a really far-out language. No, they don't have a really far-out language. They have an entirely ontically transformed linguistic ability that we don't even have a suspicion of that is learnable. And, I don't know, because they put so much stress on this diet, it's very clear that they are diddling towards something. They have a goal that they're trying to maximize. There is something there that they want to get. And when you meet many ayahuascaros and take it with many of these guys, the guys who make the good stuff are all alike. They have this weird aura. They have a voice thing that is hard to describe. But you know the concept of voice in Dune? where there was a way to just drop down a register and speak in a way that people could not resist because you set the vibe in this certain way. These ayahuascaros have this, and they have... uh, uh, Yes, it's something so outside our cultural value system that we can hardly realize what we're doing with because how many of us would go there And then how many of us would go there and go deep enough and then take the drug with these people and then be enough free of your own stuff to pay attention to what they were putting out and then to keep it enough together to create a description that you could bring back later. So, you know, it's just... The world is not empty of the new and the novel. These frontiers, this is how I ended the lecture yesterday. There are just frontiers and frontiers and frontiers in chemistry and anthropology and ethnography. uh, And some of it, we're actually talking about, you know, the transformation of the human form and not through technology but in a cleaner, biologically, uh, a a way which celebrates natural process and celebrates the vitality of the minded portion of the planet. It's an attunement, not this Gnostic thing which I evoked for you, which is, you know, people used to say of my grandfather uh, where he'd been was so-so, where he was was hell, and where he was going was paradise. And he lived his whole life that way. Well, that's a Gnostic attitude, you know. Paradise is just ahead. 
uh, I think that the paradise is a frontier of language, of intentional communication. The reason for looking at all these things, for looking at the hallucinogens and the alchemy and the mythology and all this, is because these are the materials present at hand for an assault on the citadel of true being. You know, somewhere here there is a clue. Somewhere here there is something that we can use. It's going to be an obscure sect, a peculiar mantra, a strange drug, a bizarre plant, a forgotten teaching, a lost alphabet, something that we can use so that, you know, I've talked about the, the tantric nature of the point of view that I'm putting out. Tantric in the sense of the definition of Tantra as the short path, taking seriously the idea that in a single lifetime a human being might be able to go vast distances in the project of spiritual unfolding. That, you know, we are not uh, given or fated to uh, simply incrementally advance ourselves. It is some kind of a lottery I mean, there are big winners, and I'm just very convinced that the way you enhance your position in the probability of all of this is through cognition. It will be an act of understanding. The final act of liberation will be an act of understanding. Okay, well, that's it for today, folks.